Lots of questions tonight, lots of questions with sort of similarities, so I might combine a few of them as I ask. Um, and James, you spoke about Moses pleading with God. Um, the people are very interested about God's cha plan changing or whether he lies or what. So um, how does Moses change God's mind? God's plan is unchangeable, so was he just pretending? Does that mean that God deceives slash lies about his intentions? Uh, no, it, I don't think we can pretend to, to be able to say with clarity everything that's going on here. The accusation is that somehow God's fickle, that his word can't be trusted, that he says one thing and does another. Remember, that's the first lie ever told. That's Genesis 3. You won't die, God won't follow through, take the steering wheel, you do what you want, you're, you're wiser. So that's a very wicked lie and a most damaging lie ever told. So I think in this case, you've got it, we're watching God move within his own character, within the stream. He would be absolutely justified in ending this nation and starting again with Moses. We saw it with, with Noah. He relents, he does something else, but all of it is within the orb of his character. All is utterly consistent with who he is. And so I think here we're watching, we're dealing with a living God, we're not dealing with a computer program that has simply been diverted, we're not watching a machine and we're not watching a fickle God who just does this or does that. I think in every case he's done exactly what is consistent with his character. What is shown us here is him in very gracious interrelationship with his people, in this particular case his chosen leader Moses. That doesn't answer the whole of that question, but I think we need to be humble and careful. Don't ever lay before him the accusation, you're not a God of your word, because that just doesn't stack up. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, James. Um, another one, sorry. A um, few people asking about the Israelites, sort of in contrast, how the Israelites got to building an idol when they had seen so many amazing signs that God had just performed for their very eyes, how did they, how did they get here? Excellent question. <laughs> uh, this is the sinful heart. This is, this is how dark and wicked sin is. It's so ungrateful. I was talking to Ian Porter this morning. Aaron was one of the guys who went up the mountain. Remember when Tom was preaching two weeks ago? Uh, these were the guys who, in front of God's brilliance, all they could look at was the pavement. And yet a month later, he's doing this. He's bullied into doing this, really, with the people and makes some feeble excuse later. I think here is the heartbreaking fact of sin that we see too often in our own lives and too often in the people of God. The answer is when we see it in ourselves, when this happens and it does happen, will we repent? Will we go back to that mercy seat? In our case, the, the throne of grace, Jesus, and repent? Or we just harden up and give up because that generation never made it home they never made it in the promised land they just hardened up hardened up never took the lesson on board it's so it's so grim but yeah we, we should be shocked but very watchful because we are capable of that sort of fickleness ourselves and it's very very it's so grievous isn't it yeah so i think when that happens it's tempting to just give up. I can't believe God would forgive me. You wander off and you're there you've swallowed the lie. The cross is big enough for whatever it is that we think can't be forgiven. Go back, repent, walk on. And if it's too hard to do it on your own, you can't believe it, then come and grab me or someone else and let's go to the throne of grace together. But don't stay in it if, that in case, if this describes you in some way because they just didn't. They hardened up and they never made it home. Yeah. Final question. Um, you shared with us about sort of a relationship being an idol for you. Can you give us some tips to be content with where God has us in relationships and flee from the idolatrous views of dating and marriage? Sure. There's, uh, the temptation is in, in our loneliness at times and in a highly sexualised world that just won't let, us, won't let us go. Like we're just constantly put images before us. Um, to put the prospect of a relationship, a marriage relationship in our particular case, up as something that will carry the full weight of my hopes and my fears and all the things. I can tell you from experience, Rosie, Mrs Wicks here can tell you from experience, it's simply not true. 
A marriage, no matter how healthy, godly, brilliant, is, it just can't carry that weight. It cannot be God. So, in our single state, if we, this is, and I'm assuming this is for someone who wants to be married, not everyone wants to be married. I think it's really important that we put those hopes, those fears before the Lord and that we cultivate the sort of friendship in Christ and friends outside the church as well, of course, in a way that says we are not on our own, that we have good, solid friends who speak the truth, who are engaged in right fellowship. This is an amazing gift of God. Don't skip this. Uh, and then put, keep putting those hopes forward and be someone worth marrying. If you want to be married, be someone worth marrying, which is a man or woman who are deliberately, quietly cultivating your godliness, who are devoted to prayer, who are in the thick of fellowship that has the word open. So godliness is drawn to godliness. You won't have an eye for, you won't have a desire for someone who just doesn't have the very things that you treasure the most. Uh, those who have been married by me know that we sit at some stage in preparation, we just sit in Ephesians 1 long before we get to Ephesians 4 and 5. Go and read Ephesians 1, that is a portrait of a man or woman of God. That's the guy you want waiting for you down the end of this aisle. That's the woman you want coming through those doors, radiant with those truths. So make that your desire and be patient. Be patient. It's worth the wait. Thanks very much, James. I'm going to pray as the band comes up on stage. Mm. Heavenly Father, thank you for what you have taught us tonight. And please help us to keep wrestling with our hearts and committing to you again and again, rejecting idols in our lives and worshipping you with reverence, humility and faith. Amen.